Welcome to Rod Russell's Home Learning Course, How to Play Popular Piano. You have in your hands the most powerful self-teaching program available for piano and an opportunity to play like you've always dreamed. For over a quarter of a century, Rod Russell has dedicated his life to help people discover their natural musical talents. With over 60,000 students in five countries, he's one of today's best-known music coaches. His easy, common-sense approach allows anyone to learn popular piano in an amazingly short time. People from all walks of life are using Rod's unique system to play fabulous music. Swing, blues, country, gospel, rock and roll, any popular music they like. His program provides young people and grown-ups alike with an exciting alternative to traditional piano lessons. You learn to play the music you want to play fast. So get ready for an exciting musical adventure with Rod Russell and your new home learning system, How to Play Popular Piano. To maximize your results, Rod recommends that you learn in manageable, bite-sized amounts. Take your time and enjoy the experience. Your easy step-by-step -step lessons will have you playing your favorite music sooner than you ever dreamed possible. And now, to introduce your first session of How to Play Popular Piano, here is Rod Russell. Hello and welcome to your first session of How to Play Popular Piano. My name is Rod Russell and I'm going to be your personal coach for your new home study course. During the program, we'll become great friends and together we'll discover the secrets of playing popular piano. You've chosen what is, in many people's opinion, one of the fastest, most complete programs for learning the piano. This system really does work. I've helped thousands of people learn to play with this easy method. And here's the good news. It doesn't matter how old you are or if you've ever played a note before, there's absolutely no reason you can't be playing your favorite music too. For the next few minutes, I want you to sit back and relax and I'm going to explain how to get started using your learning material. Your course is designed to provide you with the means of learning how to play good popular music in a reasonably short time. Our approach is very simple. You play the melody or the tune of your song with your right hand while your left hand plays chords and rhythm. All the material contained is standard music notation and that's important because when you complete this course I want you to be able to take any piece of standard sheet music or a songbook off the shelf and play it, complete with melody, the correct chords and the right rhythm. In addition, you'll be able to add many techniques to give your music a real professional touch. In lesson two, after we've gone through the basics of this marvelous playing style in lesson one, I'll give you a preview of how your playing will develop throughout your course using a well-known song as an example. Now just a word about the lessons. They're arranged so that each new item is followed by carefully selected songs that demonstrate that particular item. Some of the material may seem foreign at first, but don't worry. Once you start using the musical characters in songs, you'll recognize them easily. And here's another thing. If your hands feel sort of like blocks of wood, especially when you're trying to play them together, don't get discouraged. Everyone feels that way at first. The secret is to take each new song or technique very slowly, then gradually each day try to speed it up and play more smoothly without hesitation. You'll be amazed how steadily you improve. Your program is very easy to use. You simply progress through the lessons page by page. With regard to your CDs, I strongly suggest you get yourself a compact CD player that you can keep beside you at the piano. They're very inexpensive and will save you going back and forth to your stereo system. You'll notice at the top of each lesson page, the track number for your CD is shown under the page number. For the audio instruction for any page, simply skip to the corresponding track number with your CD player. 
There are approximately four seconds of space on your CDs between tracks. The best way to use your audio instruction is to watch a song or illustration on your lesson as I explain and demonstrate it. Then try it yourself. You can always review demonstrations as many times as you need. Before starting Lesson 1, make sure you've read the important information in your introductory booklet, Get Ready for Success. If you haven't, do it now, then come back to this spot. Now, let's have a look at Lesson 1. On page 3, we explore just exactly what music is. Music has developed through the ages from the very first time someone beat a stick on a hollow log. It's evolved into a universal language that everyone can relate to and enjoy. Over the years, it has taken many, many forms, from classical to jazz to popular to exotic styles, and everyone seems to have their own preference when it comes to music. That's one of the great things about it. There's a type to suit everyone's taste. In the field of popular music that we'll be looking at, there are several distinct and different types. Swing, sing-along, gospel, country, waltzes, boogie-woogie, rock, and several more. A surprising thing that many people don't realize is that all music is made up of just three principal ingredients, melody, harmony, and rhythm. Just three things. Even in the largest orchestras, every member does one of these functions. Let's talk about each one for a moment. The melody is the tune or main theme of a song. Harmony is a note or possibly several notes that sound good when played with the melody. Rhythm is the thing that gives your music its beat. If you've ever tapped your toe to a song, you'll know exactly what I mean. That is the rhythm of the song. I've tried to explain the three parts of music clearly on page 4. Read this over before going any further. On pages 5 and 6, we have some basic music theory. This is sort of the language of music. I haven't included a great deal of this in your course, but there is a certain amount that you do need to know and I want you to become very familiar with what each sign means. Let's go over each of them briefly. The staff is the basic thing that notes are written on. It consists of five parallel lines and the notes are either placed between the lines or on the line with the line going through the middle of the note. We have two clef signs on the piano, the treble clef and the bass clef. The treble clef is used for notes played on the right hand side of your keyboard. A staff always has a clef sign, treble or bass, at the extreme left hand side. For our purposes in this course, we'll deal mostly with the treble or right hand staff, but I want you to know the bass clef as I use it from time to time in illustrations. Now we come to bars and measures. The staff is broken up into segments called measures by vertical lines called bar lines. The reason for this is that so music can be broken down into groups of beats, usually three or four. Now turn to page six. Here we have the various notes and rests. A note tells you two things, which key to press and how long to hold it down for. The note's position on the staff tells you which key to strike. The shape of the note tells you how long to hold it for. Notes are really just little circles with things added to tell you how long to hold the key down for. Read this and learn it thoroughly so that you'll be able to recognize each type of note instantly and know how many counts to hold it for. Rests are just what the name implies. Their job is to fill a space in the staff where no note is to be struck. There are several different shapes and each one is worth a different number of counts. Learn these well so you can recognize them for their time values. On page 7 we have the illustration of the keyboard. The top illustration shows that the further to the right you go, 
the higher the pitch of the notes. Just play some of the keys on your piano and move up to the right of the keyboard like this. Notice how the pitch gets higher. Of course, going the other way to the left, like this, the tones get lower. The second illustration shows the basic layout of the keyboard. It's simple but really important. I want you to learn where each white key is in its position to the black keys. You see, we have a repetition of black keys. Two, then three, then two, then three again, and so on. The C keys have always been my focal point on the keyboard, with middle C being the main focal point. You'll find a C on the immediate left of every group of two black keys. Try to see how many C's you can find on your piano. If you can learn all the notes in the second illustration, you'll have a big head start. You see, there is an identical group above that, and another one above that, and so on. If you can learn those seven notes and their position with the black keys, you'll be able to find all the C's, all the E's, all the G's, etc. It's a good idea to learn these right now. Included in your kit you'll find a sheet of removable key indicators. If you're not familiar with the names of each key, you may wish to use these for a while. Place them on the keys going out to the left and to the right of middle C, including high C and low C. Once you're familiar with the key names, you can just remove them. Now let's turn to page 8. On page 8, you learn your first and most important notes on the treble staff. They match up with the keys you've just learned. Learn them one at a time. Pay special attention to where each note is located on the staff. Play these ten times each day, saying the name of each out loud as you play. Play them up. C, D, E, F, G, a, B, C, and down. C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C. These are the main notes you'll play. The better you learn them now, the quicker you'll recognize them in your songs. This will make a world of difference to your playing. Now turn to page 9. On page 9, we have an introduction to chords. A chord is simply two or more notes struck together. You'll be learning approximately 12 different types of chords throughout your course. I want you to become an expert in these. The knowledge of chords and how to use them effectively is one of the most important things you'll learn in popular music. To start out, We'll work with the simple major chord, which is the one from which all other chords are built. In the first part of the course, the left hand will be playing chords. As we go, your attention will be taken up primarily with your right hand melody. You must know your left hand chords well enough so that they'll come automatically. If you don't, your playing will be choppy and won't flow smoothly. Here's what I suggest you do. Play each new chord ten times each day, saying the name of it out loud, like this. C, 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 or G, G, G. Do this for at least a week. What we'll be doing is planting it in your mind so that you'll be able to play it instantly when you see the chord symbol. On pages 10, 11, and 12, we cover our first three chords, C major, F major, and G major. Go over these pages carefully and learn these chords and how they're shown on the music. 
If you feel a little uncomfortable, move your fingers further in toward the black keys. Let's go over each one. The first one on page 10 is C major and it is indicated by a capital C above your staff. The keys to strike are C, E, and G. Okay, the next one on page 11 is F major and it's indicated by a capital F placed above the staff. Its keys are F, A, and C. And then on page 12 we have G major chord which is indicated by a capital G above your staff and the keys to strike are G, B, and D. Read these three pages over carefully before going on. Page 13 gives you more tips about playing your left hand chords and what to do if your hands bump into each other on the keyboard. Pay special attention to right hand fingering on pages 14 and 15. It's important that you understand this before starting your songs. As explained in your introductory booklet, we'll be working with two different ways of playing your right hand melody notes. The first way, playing in octaves, is shown on page 14. Do this only if your hand is large enough to reach an octave comfortably. This technique is easy to do. You simply strike two of the same kind of key. The one shown on the music is played with your thumb, while the same key higher is struck with your little or fifth finger. For example, if the note is middle C, you would strike middle C with your thumb plus high C with your fifth finger. The advantage of playing melody in octaves is that you don't have to worry about which finger you're going to use. Try the illustration on the lower part of your page. On page 15, you're shown how to play your melody notes in single finger style. This method is easiest if you have a smaller hand, but regardless of the size of your hand, you need to learn how to do this. This is a bit easier than octaves, but you need to learn how to plan an efficient fingering. I've marked in a suggested fingering for your songs in the first few lessons, then gradually the finger numbers will be decreased so you can learn how to do this on your own. It really isn't difficult. Simply work toward a comfortable, efficient movement of your hand so you never run out of fingers to use. On page 16, we have an exercise in counting. What we have here is several lines, each with a different combination of notes and rests that add up to three counts in each measure. This is for the right hand only, and the note stays the same throughout. You can play the notes as octaves or as just single notes. Either way is fine. I'll play each line for you, then you try it. Count out loud steadily as you play. Here's the first line. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Second line. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. The third line we have a combination of half notes and quarter notes. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Fourth line is similar to the third line, but the other way around. We start with a quarter note rather than a half note. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Next line is a combination of half notes and quarter rests. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. 
The next one is a combination of quarter notes and quarter rests. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the next line is a combination of half rests and quarter notes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the last line has combinations of quarter notes and quarter rests. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. On page 17, we have our first song, Beautiful Brown Eyes. As in the exercise on page 13, there are three counts per measure. Play the melody notes with the right hand as octaves or as single notes using the fingering shown. Let's try the right hand melody first. Your first note starts on E with the third finger if you're playing single notes or your thumb on E with the uh, E above on your little finger if you're playing octaves. I'm going to count it out for you as I play it. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Okay, now you try it in the right hand. Make sure you strike the right key for each note shown, and I suggest counting it out like I did. Do it very slowly. Okay, now let's have a look at the left hand chords. Your chord names are placed above the staff. If you look, you'll see a, a C, and then another C above the second measure, then an F above the third measure, and another F above the fourth measure. All along, you'll see letter names of chords going along the top of your staff. Underneath the staff, you'll see a small C that stands for chord. So that tells you where to play the chord with your left hand. And in the first measure, you're going to play your chord, your C chord, with the first right hand note. And then hold it through to the bar line while you're playing the other notes with your right hand. And that works the same in every measure. Whether it's a C or an F or a G chord, you strike it right at the first count of the measure, hold it through to the end of the measure. Okay, I'll play the chords, naming them as I go. C... C, then F, another F, second line back to C, C, and then we have a G, and another G, third line, we have C, C, then F, F, last line, G, G, and then back to C, and one last C. Once you've practiced each hand very slowly and can play them smoothly, reasonably smoothly, put them together very slowly. I'll play it that way for you first. The thing to work toward always is smoothness without hesitation. Try to read the notes and chord symbols slightly ahead of yourself so you can be ready for each change. Practice this song till you can play it about this speed without hesitation.
Some of your songs, especially in the beginning, may seem sort of elementary, and when you finish and look back on them, they will be. But I have carefully selected each as a solid building block for you to reach your goal. It would be impossible for you to sit down and play songs like The Entertainer right off the bat, but it won't be when you finish. Now, let's try the song on page 18, the same way we did with Beautiful Brown Eyes. First, the right hand. Be sure to count out loud. I'll play it for you first. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. When you can play the right hand smoothly and have gone over your chords, try it together slowly, like this. The songs on pages 19 and 20 are similar to the last two in that the chords are the same and there are three counts per measure. Here's how Drink To Me Only should go. Do this song just like you did the others, taking it hand separately to start, counting out loud as you go. Okay, let's try On Top of Old Smokey. I'll play it for you. Practice these four songs until you can play them smoothly without hesitation. When playing the songs in the first few lessons, it's really important that you count out loud as you play. If you don't, you have to guess at the length of time you hold each note, and that doesn't work very well. After you've done this for a while, the timing will just come naturally to you without having to count. At the end of each lesson, you're given a short review of the material covered. It just sort of recaps the new things you've learned in that lesson. Complete the review of Lesson 1, and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, here are your answers, starting with number 1. Music consists of three things. They are melody, harmony, and rhythm. Number 2. The lines that the notes are written on are called the staff and consist of five lines and four spaces. 
Number three, the clef signs for the notes played on the right hand side of your keyboard is called the treble clef. Number four, the answer is the bass clef. Number five, the clef we'll be using mostly will be the treble clef. Number six, the staff is divided into measures by bar lines. Number seven, I asked you to write the name of each note or rest and how many counts each one gets. The first one is an eighth note and receives half a count. The next one is a quarter note, receives one count. The third one is a half note and receives two counts. The next one is a dotted half note and gets three counts. The one without a tail is a whole note and gets four counts. The first rest is an eighth rest, looks like a little seven, and gets a half a count. The one that looks like a squiggly line is a quarter rest and gets one full count. The next one is a little block sitting on the line, is a half rest and gets two counts. The last one is a block hanging from the line, gets four counts, and it's a whole rest. Number eight, the musical alphabet goes from A to G. And number nine, the heart of popular music, at least in my opinion, is chords. Number 10, I asked you to describe a chord. And there's a number of ways to describe it, but I think the best way to put it is that it's two or more keys struck that sound good together. Number 11, the most basic chord is a major chord. Number 12, chord names are shown in capital letters. And number 13, the answer is black keys. Before going on to lesson two, be sure you know all the material in lesson one and that you can play all the songs. When you've done this, continue on to lesson two. Let's have a look at lesson two. The first thing we're going to talk about is how we simplify reading music on page 3. It used to be that the only way of playing the piano was to read all the notes you played. You had to read a note for every key you pressed. This is still done in such music as classical and jazz. It's hard to do. You see, if you're going to play full, complete songs with melody, harmony, and rhythm, plus all the other nifty things that make up a great song, there's a tremendous amount of notes to be played. To get to be a good enough note reader would take literally years of hard work. For most of us, that just isn't practical. There is a better way, and you have the opportunity to learn it in this course. All you will ever have to read is one note at a time, and yet your songs will be as complete as if you were reading an entire score. Why? Because of the know-how you'll acquire. Chords, harmonies, rhythm techniques, and a myriad of other things to dress up your songs and make them sound professional. In the illustration at the bottom of page 3, you'll see three measures of a typical line of music that you would find in any popular songbook or piece of sheet music. The bottom two lines are part of the score that I was referring to. On these lines, you would read every note on the treble and bass clef as you play. With our system, you would disregard those two lines. Above the words of the song, you'll see a staff with a treble clef sign and notes going along one at a time. Above the staff, you'll see chord symbols C, F, and G. These are the parts that we use. A single note melody line for the right hand and a chord symbol line for the left. That's all you have to read. Everything else that you put in will come from the knowledge you'll acquire here. Now turn to page 4. The illustration on page 4 of the staff and the piano keyboard is put there for a reference guide only. I don't expect you to learn all these right now. However, I would like you to have a look at how the different notes are placed on the two staffs. 
page 5 is included as an exercise to help you become familiar with the various musical signs. Draw a few of each on the lines provided, then turn to page 6. On page 6, we have the song Old Man Brown and a new sign to learn called the tie. The tie is a curved line joining two notes that are the same. You'll encounter curved lines joining notes that are not the same. These are not ties. When you come to two notes that are the same with a tie between them, you strike the first one and hold it for its full-time value, then instead of releasing it, you keep holding it for the time value of the second note as well. You do not strike the second note. I'll play Old Man Brown for you. Now you try it, hand separately at first, counting out loud. Hold the tied notes for their correct time value. As with all the songs, you have a choice of playing your right hand melody in octave form or as single notes. When you've gone over this one, go on to the song on page 7. On page 7, we have the song The Bowery. Here we have a new note for the right hand. It's the B below middle C. You have one in the last measure of the first line, and there's also one in the last measure of the third line. In both measures, the left hand chord is G. I suggest you play the G chord in the lower position. Remember in lesson one, the G chord was illustrated in two positions. The reason to play it lower is that with your right hand on B below middle C, your hands could bump into one another when you play the G chord in its higher position. I'll play this song for you. Notice the tied notes in the last two measures. When you've gone over this one a few times, go on to page 8. The little song on page 8 is put here for additional practice on what we've learned so far. Here's how it would go. Okay, turn to page 9. In lesson 1, I promised I'd give you a preview of how your playing style will develop throughout your course. So relax for a few minutes, and I'll show you how you'll build the simple method you learned in lesson 1 into a fabulous playing style for popular music. As you've seen so far, in our method of playing popular piano, the melody, or tune, is played mostly with the right hand. The left hand looks after what I call chord accompaniment. That is to say, the left hand provides rhythm and harmony for your songs. To illustrate, I'm going to use one of the most beautiful songs ever written. It's called Londonderry Air and is also known as the song Danny Boy. I'm going to play it for you three times. The first time, I'll play the same way you played your songs in Lesson 1. Simple melody with the right hand and simple chords with the left. The second time will be how you will be able to play the song about halfway through your course. The last time will show you how you'll play it when you finish. What you'll see 
is that the basic style you've learned in Lesson 1 won't change. We just keep expanding it and adding techniques to make it more exciting to play and listen to. Here we go. Simple melody, simple chords. Now, let's imagine you're about halfway through your program. You've learned how to add rhythm to your songs. You've learned new chords and new ways to play them. You've also got a few tricks up your sleeve to dress your songs up. Quite an improvement, but it gets even better. Now let's imagine you've finished the 32 lessons in your program. Congratulations! Now you have a variety of rhythm techniques, you've expanded your right hand melody, you know how to syncopate your rhythm, and you have a host of other very cool techniques to make your music sound professional. Now let's hear how you'll play this beautiful song. The basic structure of your songs remain the same. Melody with the right hand and chording with your left. But the songs become fuller and fuller as you increase your knowledge and are able to add more and more of the nifty techniques to dress your songs up. The great thing about playing this way is that it's based on know-how rather than just mechanical note reading. There are many things you'll learn to make your music sound exciting and professional. You can use just the things you think sound good in each particular thing you try. That's the key to playing popular music. If it sounds good to you, then it's probably right. I don't know what your personal taste in music is, but I'm sure there are types of music you like and some you don't. We all have our personal preference. I've always felt that a pianist should be pretty versatile. Unfortunately, up until now, there have been very few piano courses that provide any degree of versatility. For instance, how many people do you know who took piano lessons for quite a few years in some cases who cannot sit down and accompany a sing-song? There are literally thousands of people like this. The techniques you'll learn here will prepare you for a very versatile style of playing. You will be able to play any kind of popular music you like, and also... The techniques lend themselves naturally if you wish to learn to play by ear. Now let's go on to page 10. 
On this page, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about time signatures. Timing is one of the most important things when playing popular music. It's the thing that gives your song rhythm. Without it, your songs won't have very much life in them. The time signature is an important part of all this. It consists of two numbers, one on top of the other, and it's placed right at the beginning of the first line of every song. The top number tells you how many counts in each measure. The bottom tells you what kind of note gets one count. For example, if there is a four on the bottom, it stands for quarter note. So a quarter note gets one count. Then obviously, if a quarter note gets one count, a half note would get two counts, a dotted half three counts, and so on. Now, in the case of 6-8 time, at the bottom of the page, the 8 stands for eighth note. So an eighth note would get one count. A quarter note would get two counts, a half note four counts, etc. The 6 on the top tells you that there are six counts in each measure. In other words, there are six eighth notes in each measure or other notes and rests that would add up to six eighth notes. Read this over until you feel you understand it. It's really important. Now let's turn to page 11. Here we have an exercise to help your counting and your grasp of timing. The first three lines are in three-quarter time with three counts per measure. The last three lines are in four-four time with four counts per measure. I've arranged the notes and rests in measures to illustrate the various combinations that you have. The only note you play in the right hand is F throughout the exercise. I did this so you can concentrate on how the note and rest values match up with the counts. I'll play it one line at a time and then I want you to practice it. This is for the right hand only. Okay, here's the first line. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Second line. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the third line. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. And the fourth line. Now we're in four, four time. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And the next line. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And the last line. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. On page 12, we have another illustration to help your timing. But this time, I want you to write in the counts in each measure. Again, this is for the right hand only. I'll play each line counting out loud. You write in the counts 1, 2, 3, or, as in the last three lines, 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, the last three lines in four, four time. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. 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 One, two, 
three, four, one, two, three, four. Once you've jotted in the counts for this one, play it yourself like I did and count out loud. When you feel you've got it, go on to page 13. On page 13, we have a song that is a bit more difficult. You have to make quick moves with your right hand. For example, in the second measure of the first line, you jump from E to C. This must be done without interrupting your steady counting. I'll play it for you. The last two songs are put there for you to practice the techniques you've learned. If you have time, do them by all means. If you don't, you can omit them. Here's how the first one would go. Now, here's the song on page 15. On page 16, I've included an illustration to show you the basics of how an acoustic piano works. Of course, if you're using an electronic instrument, this doesn't apply. It isn't mandatory that you become an expert on the mechanics of it, but I felt you should have an idea of what happens when you press one of the keys. One note, however, you should be sure all the keys work on your piano and that it is in tune. Your ear will tell you that. If not, I would suggest you get in touch with a reliable piano technician and put it in good working order. An instrument that is out of tune or that doesn't work too well can quickly make you lose interest because your music just won't sound like it should no matter how hard you try. When you feel you've mastered the material in this lesson, turn to page 17 and complete the review. Then we'll go over the answers. Okay, here are your answers. Number one, chord name symbols are found above the treble staff. Number two, we simplify reading music by ignoring the piano score. When playing regular music, the single note melody line shown above the piano score is played with your right hand. Number four, we use the chord symbol for our left hand. Number five, the two numbers placed on the first line of a song right after the treble clef sign is called a time signature. Number six, the top number of your time signature tells you how many counts per measure. And number seven, the sign that sometimes is put in place of the numbers that describe 4-4 four, four time is a C with a line through it, a vertical line through it. Okay, number nine, I asked you to write in the counts, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, under the lines of music below. In the first line, you have three counts per measure, so let's go over it. You should have a one count under the first quarter note, two under the next quarter note, and three under the third quarter note in the first measure. 
Second measure, you should have a one under the half note, two by itself, three under the quarter note. In the third measure, you should have a one under the quarter note, a two count under the half note, and then your third count would be by itself before the end of the measure. In the last measure, you should have one under the dotted half, and then a two and a three afterward before the end of the measure. Okay, the second line is in 4-4 four, four time, four counts per measure. You should have your first count under the first quarter note, second under the second quarter note, third under the third quarter note, and fourth count under the fourth quarter note. In the second measure, you should have your first count under the half note, two by itself, third count under the next half note, and then the fourth count by itself. In the third measure, you should have a one under the dotted half, then your second and third counts by themselves, and then your fourth count should be under the quarter note. In the last measure, you should have a one under the whole note, then two, three, and four counts by themselves before the end of the measure. I wish you the best of luck with Lessons 1 and 2. You've made an excellent start. You can look forward to fresh, exciting new material in Lessons 3 and 4 to help guide you toward your goal. Before you know it, you'll be playing popular piano. This is Rod Russell saying goodbye for now. <laughs>